we sang that last hymn, whether you realized the implications of what was being sung there. He is here. Do you remember? Did you pick that up? He is here. Did you know that Jesus said that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there you are, or there he is, in the midst of them. I find it very awesome to think that Jesus is here amongst us. Jesus knows our hearts. And we are praying to someone who we cannot see here, but who has promised that he will be here. And so we are now going to speak to God. We are going to speak to Jesus. I find that very awesome. To think that the one who died for me is here, waiting to hear from all of us. And so as we speak, we speak to Jesus. And I ask you to be with me as we come together in prayer and as I lead you in prayer as we talk to Jesus. O oh God our Father, we bow before you in, in humble adoration. You are our God and we are your people. Thank you for loving us, even though we are slow to respond so often to your love for us. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. When we experience hard times, we know that you are near. Thank you, Lord, for prayers that have been answered. Many have prayed and have experienced healing and found a way to deal with their troubles. We bless and thank you for ministering to troubled souls. Lord, we listen to our news bulletins and we have been shocked at so many evil things. Murders have been committed. Wars are being raged. The courts are overflowing with atrocities committed. Many are suffering from hunger and unemployment. Things are made worse through lack of service deliveries and no water or electricity in many places. O oh Lord, some have already lost hope. Some are filled with fear. Some are longing to be close to loved ones. And we confess that there have been times when we have grown weary even of praying, especially when we have not seen the results that we have longed for. O oh Lord, forgive us, we pray, that at times we have doubted your goodness and thought that you have neglected and that abandoned us. We know that's not true, Lord. So forgive us that we have allowed such thoughts even to creep into our lives when your word reaches us so clearly that all things work together for good or for those who love God and, according, and are called according to his purpose. O oh Lord, pardon, heal, and restore us, we pray, so that we might trust you completely in spite of the circumstances surrounding us. Lord, we want to pray for the staff and leaders of our church here at St. James. Inspire our ministers as they bring your word to us, that we may know your will and your purpose for us. Touch our hearts, we pray, as we have just sung a moment ago. Lord, bless also those who have so liberally donated food, which we are able to distribute to others, and have, who have nothing or little to eat. Lord, bless those involved in that ministry. As we pray for ministries, we remember the ministry to the aged, who are experiencing the pangs of loneliness 
and fear, and fear of what might become of them. O oh Lord, draw near to all the elder folk, we pray. Show us, Lord, how we can minister to our senior citizens. And Lord, we come this morning also to pray especially for the staff of our Valcom Church. Be near to them in these trying times, Lord. We pray for Kelebochili as she tries to partner with, with parents and other rich churches. Help her with kids being wrongly influenced by those who are not interested. We pray for the envisaged regional camp which she is organizing. May your spirit touch every heart so that many children will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. We also pray for a better residence for Kelly Bochili. Now we pray also for Sean, Lord, in the struggling agony of the struggling economy, economy of Valcom. Lord, please lead and guide him to success in school ministries. Also in the evening growth group, inspire him through your Holy Spirit and revive him in times of illness. We commit him to you, Lord. And lastly, Lord, we want to pray for ourselves. Please keep us focused on you and your love and your care and your compassion in spite of what we see happening around us and in our world. Lord, it's so easy to keep focusing on that which is negative, but please keep us from despair, from losing hope, and from giving up. We don't want to do that, Lord, and we need your strength to help us. May we be constantly aware of your presence through the darkest hours and through every storm that spiritually envelops us. Thank you, Lord, for your promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. We long to keep going with you at our side. Please take care of us, Lord, and keep us safe from stumbling or falling into sin. We ask these prayers in Jesus' name, our beloved Lord and Saviour. Amen. Good morning. Our two readings today are taken from Exodus chapter 16 verses 9 to 26 and 2 Corinthians 8 verses 1 to 8. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall, you shall each take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, 
Let no one leave any of it over till morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two oats each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, This is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over, lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside, laid it aside till the morning, as Moses commanded them. And it did not stink. And there were no worms in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. And our second reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty has overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favour of taking part in the relief of the saints, and this not as we expected. But they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, in our, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. It's good to be my second home, I suppose. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Sean, I'm from Valcom, I used to be part of the St. James Furniture, uh, and then um, I got an upgrade, or downgrade, <laughs> depends which way you want to look at it, uh, and so I am the minister in Valcom, uh, so maybe just something on Valcom and how it's going there, something on myself maybe, uh, so Valcom is Valcom, I always think Valcom is like that second cousin that you sort of, the black sheep of the family, uh, everyone loves the person but doesn't want them near. Uh, <laughs> And invariably, just when you think it's going well, they'll disappoint you. And uh, that's pretty much welcome. So economically, just when you think it goes well, it'll disappoint you. Just when you think people are, are getting better or on the right road, they'll disappoint you. Uh, but there are some positives. And so the churches in Valcom are, are still quite active, um, quite sound. Uh, they haven't all climbed on the bandwagon of becoming super big and very rich. Um, they're quite conservative, so that's positive and there's a good... Uh, fraternity and, and sort of a communi communion of, of believers and ministers and that's great and the schools are really good um, probably not on par with Bloom schools with regards to sport and academics but value-based uh, the schools are still uh, really good uh, so they still pray and have Bible readings and exam prayer and all those kind of things uh, so there's a wonderful avenue to minister in the schools uh, so please pray for that it is a open door for now until someone closes it uh, so God willing, that will bear much fruit. Um, the church, we've still got lots of kids, too many kids for us to manage. Uh, adults are a problem. Um, they are lost, I suppose, and we need to find them. So pray for that. And then just something on my health, for those who maybe know, I had some heart issues. Uh, it's still beating, that's why I'm here. Um, and so there's nothing major wrong. They found that I was born that way. Uh, so... I'll still live to be old, God willing, and gray and grumpy. Um, I won't be able to run the comrades, but that's not because of my heart. Um, <laughs> uh, so, to the sermon this morning. And one of the things that I, I don't want you to, to 
sort of have is whenever the church speaks about money, immediately the walls go up. And there's a couple of reasons why that happens. One is, those that understand that, oh, the church wants more money. Um, or needs to make the budget, you know, sort of meet uh, those numbers sort of need to, to balance. Or we have this affront to anything that has to do with blessing and anything that has to do with money because of how it's mistaught or taught in the wrong way, often in many churches. Uh, we sort of immediately just say, no, 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 I don't want to hear this. Um, it's probably going to go down that route. And so we, we sort of block our ears, close our eyes and, and hope that it'll just the series will go past. And so what, one of the things I want to do, and, and that's the great privilege of being the guest preacher, you can do what you want, is, is start a thought process and a heart process in each of us. And, and that process is to sort of question how we think about life, not just about money. It's how we think about God's relation to us and what do we really believe our role is here. Now, one of the issues that we have, and it's something that our society is very prone to, is what's called the lie of scarcity. Now, the lie of scarcity is what it says. We believe that there isn't enough, that there isn't sufficiency, that, that if I don't get the mock down pair of Nike shoes now, I'll never get it. If I don't get that beauty product, because it's not just about saving money, it's also about the sufficiency of beauty, the sufficiency of, of governance, the sufficiency of everything, right? It's not just about money. So if I don't vote for the right political party, our country will fall apart. Now, there's elements of truth, obviously, in all of this, but if I don't have this or that, then that and this won't happen. Now, the media is really good at using the lie of scarcity and making you feel a little bit uh, less than you should. And so there's a reality around saying, well, you're not quite there. You haven't quite made it. You're not as beautiful as you could be. You're not as rich as you could be. You're not as this as whatever. Therefore, buy our product. And so you're bombarded daily by the lie of scarcity. But see, the lie of scarcity is actually a question of faith and of sovereignty. It's a theological question. It's a question about what do I truly believe about God? And what do I truly believe about His sovereignty? Now, sovereignty is just a really big word that means God is in control. You know, do we really believe that God governs South Africa? Do we really believe that God looks after me as an individual? Do I believe that God has my best interests at heart, not my comfort, not my leisure, not my blessing, to use words that are thrown around, but my growth, my maturity, my godliness. Do I believe that? You see, the lie of scarcity, this, this idea that's thrown around all the time, is actually a God question. It's a faith question. It's a, it's a, is God really sovereign? And I see this was an issue from the Old Testament. Actually, right in the beginning in Genesis, we'll get to that now. But a wonderful passage in Scripture that brings us to the fore is that piece in Exodus that we read. And, and if you know the story, these bunch of slaves that have been rescued from Pharaoh are like good South Africans and they complain about everything. And they're in a desert. And there isn't food, if you know anything about desert, there's lots of sand and not much else. And yet by the hand of God, they are provided for. And they've had this miraculous salvation and brought through the Red Sea. And they've seen so much, experienced so much. And then God makes manna, which in Hebrew just is, what is this? They don't, we don't know, it's just what is this? And quail. And so they have bread and meat in abundance, as much as they could eat. And yet, even in that theological crisis, they gather to store. They gather because they do not believe that God will give them tomorrow. And so it rots and Moses is angry with them. But something of their heart is ours as well. Something of their heart is 
We need to gather to be self-sufficient, to rely on ourselves. We need more, we need policies, we need, and all those things are good. Please don't cancel your policies. Um, but the heart is the issue. And we see it in more ways than just provision, right? So in, in, right in the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, it's how the story starts, is even the serpent. Now the lie was, but there's something that you're lacking. There's a scarcity. You don't know the full truth, Eve. You're not going to die. Just eat. God's hiding something from you. There's not full knowledge. You don't have it all. Now be self-sufficient, Eve. Eat, and you'll know. Don't rely on God. I believe what he says. And so she eats. And she believes the lie of scarcity. In that case, scarcity of knowledge. Knowledge of good and evil. We see it with Abraham. And so in Genesis 15 is the covenant. It's what Ray was alluding to in Waymaker. It starts in chapter 12, 15, 17. is the three covenant passages. Amazing how God promises a people and a land and a future, a covenant people, Israel. In chapter 16, they're making plans for their own people. Sarah arranges Hagar and Hagar becomes Abraham's what would be a slave wife slash mother of child. They take it into their own hands because they believe that they must make a plan for the succession of their people. And so they don't believe God. They believe the lie of scarcity. Unless we do something, this won't come about. And chapter 12 and chapter 15 become in some ways obsolete because they make the plan in chapter 16. And it happens again in chapter 20 where, where Abraham actually puts the covenant at risk where he lies about who Sarah is and says, it's my sister. And the reality of that is she could have been taken and she could have become pregnant, if you understand what taken means, by someone else. I see Abraham too, the great Abraham, also had a theological crisis. We see it with Saul. A part of Saul's story is in, chap in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 8 is this push from the people, we need a king, we need to be like everyone else. This theocracy, this idea that God governs us, it's not on. We need to get with the times, get with the program. It is the norm that people have a king. Then we can be like everyone else. See, because if we're not like everyone else, we're missing out. And they believed the lie of scarcity. And so Saul is, uh, becomes king. And even Saul believed the lie of scarcity. He couldn't wait for Samuel. And so he presents the offering before God. So that they could go into battle at the right time. That him as a good general, because that's Saul's mandate. He was a big, strong man who liked to beat people up. It's an opportune time to fight. And so he did the religious rituals quickly so that at least they could be blessed. Scarcity. He could not believe that God would be with them. Now throughout the Old Testament, the reality of this lie of scarcity is in many ways the reasons for idolatry. And most of the idols that you track through the Old Testament are idols of fertility. And so people would look at their crops, realize that if it doesn't rain, crops don't grow. And so they would then run towards the fertility cults and do whatever they required so that they could make it rain. Because they didn't really believe God would make it rain. They didn't really rely on God as the one who would provide they preferred to follow the idols that had a cause and effect. If I sacrifice, it will rain. If I do this, it will rain. Even if it meant sacrificing my own child. You see, the lie of scarcity even becomes the reason for their ungodly diplomacy. It's why Solomon had so many wives. He wasn't mad or loony. He was a great diplomat. If you marry all the princes around you, princesses, sorry, that might go down in the modern world, princesses <laughs> around you, no one will wage war with you. They're not going to attack their own daughter and their own lineage. 
And so he would marry left, right, and center, starting with the big boys, Pharaoh. Because God couldn't protect them. God couldn't make them bigger. Through good diplomacy, excellent governance, Well, as Christians, we should believe something slightly different. And this is what I would like to challenge you. This, these two concepts, and this is what I'd love for you to go and speak of over your leg of lamb, which is probably a scarcity item these days, is the flip side. And that we see in, in, in our passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, is the truth of sufficiency. That there is enough. And that more importantly, God is enough. Now, some of the things, and this is the qualifiers, if we look at our passage, is we have this Macedonian church that Paul is using as an example. Obviously, this letter is written to, by the name, Corinthians. But he's using the Macedonian church as an example of their giving, and they're trying to solve a problem that's in Jerusalem. There's huge drought and there's issues in Jerusalem. The church is heavily persecuted there. And they are struggling financially, literally starving, the Jerusalem church. And the Macedonians give out of their desire to help. And Paul then uses this extreme example to teach the Corinthian church something, to teach us. And this is the truth of sufficiency. Now, one of the things we need to remember, and it is an example of the Macedonian church, is they didn't give because it was the right circumstance. A lot of people say, well, when I have this, that, and the next in line and, and all these things figured out, but then I will up my giving or I'll be able to be more generous or then I will be able to not believe the lie of scarcity. I'll be able to do more. I see that the circumstances were not right. They were not actually, you know, geared towards being very generous. On the contrary, it says they gave out of their, and the word their extreme poverty. I don't know if you know much about the ancient world, probably not. Most people lived in poverty. Struggled to eat every day. That was the norm. That was like standard protocol. And not always just because of lack of finance or ability to buy, but just because there was a supply chain shortage. They didn't have a checkers or a Woolworths or whatever you might to go and buy it. It was barter and trade and if then potatoes weren't ready, you didn't have potatoes. And out of their extreme poverty, in spite of the fact that they themselves were poor, the Macedonian church, they gave. So we're not waiting for the right circumstance. So we see it again because it says, even though they're facing severe affliction, I mean, that there should be a church that themselves are trying to hoard money to survive. They themselves should be trying to, you know, just get through this. And when we get through this, sure, we'll send, we'll help. Now, Jerusalem, you've got it bad. There's a drought there. But, but have you been here? Yeah, we're surrounded by pagans, heathen. People want to kill us. There's some serious affliction going on here. So maybe we should just hold back on the giving moment. Because we're not sure what will happen tomorrow. See, the circumstances were not right. In fact, it goes further and says, beyond what they could afford, they gave, but beyond what they could actually afford, beyond which made sense. It put them in a spot of vulnerability. And it put them in a wonderful faith, place of faith. Because immediately their self-sufficiency was taken from them. Immediately their own ability to look after tomorrow was gone. And they were willing to do that. And so one of the things that you can wrestle of over, uh, uh, over your chicken salad this afternoon um, is the truth of sufficiency. Is, uh, are you believing some of those realities of, of well, I'll wait. You just need to get this that thing paid off and this sorted out and that and this and next. 
there will never be a right circumstance to give. It will always cost you. Well, why could the Macedonian church do this or live like this or be this radical, if you like? Well, I think there was a, a right heart. There was something within them that was different to everyone else. Paul says there was, a, there was an abundance of joy. Now, I don't know. I've been in the church a couple of, well, my whole life probably, but been in ministry for a while, and I've never seen people jump up and down and have an abundance of joy when, and that word linked to giving. I've never seen people be overwhelmed with gladness at the opportunity as a corporate community to help. To whip out their checkbooks and sign away money. I've seen people maybe obliged, maybe feel that they should and it's the right thing and, and maybe even give gladly in the sense of we are serving the Lord. But Paul is speaking of this overwhelming joy. Probably the kind of joy that my kids get when they go up an escalator. Because in Balcom there are none. It's a true story, sad but true. The Macedonian church is also, as Paul says, there's this wealth of generosity. This is not just a once-off occurrence where somehow everything aligned and, and maybe there's something in the tea. There's a heart of generosity, and it's an abundance of generosity. There's something happening within this church where they are glad there's a joy to give, but it's overflowing, a continuous idea that they just, what, what can we be involved with? What can we get our hands involved with? And perhaps the most important part about this right heart is there was no seriously gifted preacher that coerced them. There were no Bible verses that were promised blessing. There was nothing behind it. There was no someone that was trying to convince them with great oratory skill and Bible persuasion to do this. It says, and Paul says, that this was of their own accord. They did it. No one made them. And so in me, my, my, my brain asks the question, well, why? Why would you willingly be like that? I think they had the right vision. And perhaps, yeah, along with your chicken salad or, or lamb, leg of lamb, is to ask this around your own family, maybe your extended family, is what is your vision of life? The purpose, what you here for? See, the language used in, in this passage about the Macedonians is, is, is profound. It, it could be ten sermons long. We won't bore you with ten, but go and read it. Go wrestle. But there's words used here. This is a grace given by God. It's an opportunity, an extension of the understanding of the gospel story. That God is empowering them to do this, but He's empowering them to do this because they get something of the gospel. We know this because they devoted themselves, Paul says, first to the Lord. And out of that, out of this relationship with God, out of this knowing what is really meaningful in this life, what provides real meaning, they devote themselves to others, or in this case to the Corinthians, or to Paul for the, for the Jerusalem collection. And they consider themselves the privileged to be able to give. I mean, it reminds me of when the, the, the disciples, actually the apostles, are, are beaten and they leave and they praise God because they were found worthy to get beaten. In their poverty, they find themselves privileged and favored to be able to give. See, their vision of life is very different.
See, I think it is because they had a right love. Well, firstly, a love for Jerusalem, and not that I don't mean the holy city and everything that goes with Jerusalem. I mean their brothers and sisters in the fellow church in Jerusalem who were literally starving. They couldn't eat their lamb, leg of lamb, knowing that their Jerusalem brothers and sisters didn't have. They wrestled with the reality of, but there are some who are in need, and we have. And so that reminds me of Acts, which says, and they all shared, not gave so that there was some communist society, they all shared so that no one had need. It was fueled by love because there is a reality in this world that there are those who have need. And it flows out of the right idea and understanding of the gospel message. That if we have been transformed by God's love for me, how do I then repay that? I can't earn it, can't buy it. A life of thanksgiving is a life of offering in all its avenues. It means giving of your time when it's inconvenient. Giving of your skills when you'd rather be watching the rugby. And giving of your resources when you would rather spend it to protect tomorrow. As a case study, I want to go back to our passage in Luke. And I'd ask you to open there. It's only four verses long. Luke 21, 1 to 4. Before I read the passage, and that's how I'm going to close, I'm going to read it, and I'd love for it to be very weighty and just leave you with it to think about. And maybe as Ray put up that hole in your soul to go, and go wrestle with God about this. It's just to color in this passage. Luke loves to, to put passages in places for a reason. And if you go back a little bit, they argue about tax. And so there's an idea around money, money, should we be paying? And they're trying to trap Jesus here. That's the basis of that. But they're so concerned about exactly the, the, you know, the, the random cent that should be paid over. Money, money, money. There's this, this concern around all that they could possibly get. And after this story, all verses, a few verses on, Jesus predicts wars and persecution. And we know that the Jerusalem gets destroyed in 70 after Christ by the Romans. There's a revolt and everything gets smashed to pieces. And all that remains of the temple is what's there still today. And he has the reality, and this is the check, because Luke doesn't put anything in there that God didn't want it. Want in there. You might think your world is very secure, very sure. You've got a plan and figured out. And whatever comes tomorrow, you've got this. I'm pretty sure the Pharisees and all those who were there contending and this, then the next did not know that their world would literally come crumbling down. That everything that they knew would be destroyed and many of them were killed. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow putting two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they contributed 
out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Amen. Father, help us believe that you are sufficient, that you are the one who provides. You are the one who protects and rules tomorrow. You are the one who is sovereign and in control. Forgive us, Lord, when we have our own plans. When we think ourselves so wise. Lord, forgive us when we have not been good stewards of what we have. When we have saved for a rainy day. While our brothers and sisters might stop. But in these matters, Lord, we ask for great wisdom. That we would know which... is a rejection of your sovereignty and which is wise stewardship for tomorrow. Help us be discerning and help us to use all that you give to build your kingdom now. Amen.